I'll record and yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. And that way if it does kick you off or you can't be here for some reason, we'll do that. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go for it. Okay, so this um, section in the book, now I will say me and Ms. Euler have mapped out like the first 15 cycles. And we wanna make sure that we teach like everything that's 100% necessary for you guys to move on and be successful in math. So we've actually already taken out a couple lessons of this first chapter, like just in case, you know, you know, last year we went to just three days a week e-learning and we couldn't get everything in. Like I couldn't even, I didn't have time to get to the last chapter, but it wasn't necessary. Like I didn't feel bad about not getting to it because they'll learn the next chapter next year. Like it wasn't a big deal. So I will say we are trying to do some things on your behalf and take some things out. Like we took out P.1, that first section. Um, we, we're not even doing that. So you won't be assessed on it. We took out another lesson this chapter. So we're trying to make sure what you guys are taught is 100% what you guys need moving forward. Okay. We've already looked ahead at second semester. There's actually two chapters second semester that aren't in the standards for algebra two. They're really good chapters. Um, but we've already looked ahead and like, if we need to cut those chapters, we can. Um, so we've, we've been playing with that. So my point is we're not going to try to jam pack everything. Uh, and we're going to kind of make sure you do get everything you need. Okay. This section P.2, we're going to, we're splitting it up into three. There's so much info in this section. We're splitting it up into three different class periods. Like last class was the exponent rules. That was the first third of this section. Today, we're talking about the relationship between radicals and exponents. Like that's the middle part of the section. And then next class, we're getting into rationalizing denominators and stuff like that. The third part of the section. This section is very, very meaty. And so th that's why I said part B. This is the middle part of the section. Some of this stuff you guys are going to have some background knowledge with. And some of this stuff is brand new. And I think that's why this chapter gets a little uh, um, misunderstood in terms of the chapter title. It's called prerequisite. So a lot of students think I should know all this stuff. And that's not true. Like some of the, it's just called prerequisite, maybe for college, but there's going to be some new stuff mixed with some old stuff in this, in this section. Okay. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of vocab on here. And first of all, that stands for the cube root of 180, right? You guys deal with square roots all the time. Did you guys get into cube roots at all last year, or the year before you guys yeah, messed with them? If you had to guess, in general, what the cube root of eight is. Why? It is. <laughs> yeah, so, so think about square roots, all right? Like a square root is asking what number can you multiply by itself twice to get to that number, right? A cube root is just saying what number can you multiply by itself three times to get that number? So if I said the cube root of eight, well, now I got to think what number can I multiply by itself three times to get there? And that would be two. Okay. I will say a lot of our tests and quizzes in this class are going to have non-calculator components. There are now, when I ask you guys non-calculator questions, I'm not going to be asking high level arithmetic questions. Okay. But there are some things that I feel like you should know, like you should know your perfect squares up to 12. Like, I think if I asked you what seven squared is or what the square root of 121 is, like, those are things that I would feel comfortable putting on a non-calculator section, okay? But I'm not going to say, you know, you should know the square root of 2056 or something like that. I have no idea what that is, but I'm not going to ask that. But those are, those are fair game questions. The other fair game questions, I would say we need to know what two cubed is. We should know three cubed. <coughs> four cubed, five cubed, maybe six cubed. Like these are fair game questions. So if you guys are taking an assessment and I say, you know, what's the cube root of 125? These are probably the ones that I think are fair game. Okay. So eight, 27, 64, 125, and 216. I would say these are fair game, non-calculator questions. Anything past this, I'm not going to ask you to do without a calculator. Okay. So these are the kind of things, if I ask you non-calc, what you can expect. All right. But going back to the cube root of 180. Now, I don't know what the cube root of 180 is. I, I have no idea, but I don't care about that right now. I just want to talk about some vocab. Okay. 
okay? This number that you see right here is called the index. It's called the index or the root. It's not just limited to three. I mean, you could take the fourth root of something, fifth root, sixth root, like you can go up forever. But that's called the index. The symbol, the actual symbol is called the radical symbol. That's the radical symbol, the actual symbol. And then the number inside the radical is called the radicand. So just some vocab, are you gonna be assessed on the vocab? No, like I'm not gonna have vocab portions on your assessments, but this is just, if you hear me say things that you know what I'm talking about. If I'm like the radicand on this one is nine, you know I'm talking about the number under the radical. So this will allow me to talk math to you guys um, if you know what the vocab is, okay? So we're gonna jump into these examples here and this is where some prior knowledge should come into play, okay? If I ask you guys to simplify a radical, I'm not asking you to take your calculator and type like the square root of 180. I guess what I should say is, if there's no index right here, what number is actually there? There's a two, think square root, square being two, like three squared, you have an exponent of a two. So if you say square root, then that means the index is two. So if you don't see an index there, there's actually an index of two understood to be there. Okay. Kind of like if you have an X, you know, there's a one in front of it that we don't write. There's uh, it's being raised to the first power. It's being divided by one. Like all those ones are there. We just don't write them. Same idea. But we're not going to enter the square root of 180 in the calculator. Like I don't want a decimal answer. Now in middle school, you guys learn how to simplify radicals. And I know you learn different methods and different strategies. And this is where I'm going to say, whatever you were taught and feel comfortable with, do that. Who has a strategy? Like, who remembers what they did back in middle school? Yeah. Uh, like, like a factor tree, yeah. right? How many of you guys remember doing factor trees? Okay. Did anybody do like something different? Well, then hell's bells. Let's do a factor tree. Okay. So we're going to start. I don't care how you guys even show the work. Like I know some teachers will like show it off to the side, like all the numbers. Some people do like keep the square roots as they break it down. I, I don't care what you guys do as long as you can get to the answer. Okay. Um, but I'm going to do a factor tree. So I got to find two numbers that multiply to be 180 and it could be any two numbers. I don't care what those two numbers are. Yeah. Nine and 20. You could do two and 90. You could do 18 and 10. Like that's completely up to you. <laughs> I usually try to find two numbers closer together to keep the branches a little equal, but that's just that completely irrelevant. All right, so I have nine and 20. Now we gotta break these numbers down. So three and three, 20, four and five, two and two. Again, some teachers like do, they break it down in different ways. I, it doesn't matter to me how you guys do that. So once we do the factor tree, now what are we looking for? Yeah, go ahead. Pairs. We look for pairs, okay? Any pair, they don't have to be next to each other, but any, I, I identify my prime factors. Here's the deal. I like to underline the prime factors, not necessary, but I like to identify them because the other numbers you are completely done with. Like we are done with 180, we're done with the nine, the 20, the four, all the rest of our work revolves around these prime factors, okay? And we're looking for pairs of them. So I have a pair of threes, I have a pair of twos. Eli, keep going since you're walking us through. Now what? We identify the pairs. Now what happens? Yeah. So for every pair you have, one of them is going to go away. And I'll explain why in a second. It kind of seems like magic, but one of them is going to go away. The other one is going to come out in front of the radical. And anytime you have more than one thing outside, or if you have more than one thing that didn't have a pair, you're always multiplying your stuff together. So we have three times two, we have six on the outside. And then we have five left on the inside. So six squared of five is our answer. If you have a calculator, a quick way you can check, I, I always think it's good to check answers in here, but a quick way to check and see if you're right. In your calculator, you would do the square root of 180. You get some answer. I don't know what you're gonna get. It's gonna be 13 point something. 
but then you also do six times the square root of five and see if you get the same answer. Like when you simplify stuff, what you start with should be exactly equivalent to what you end with. You should have the same exact value. So that's just a quick way to check in your calculator if you did it correctly. Do square root of 180, do six times square root of five, bada boom. Now, does anybody know what you're actually like? Why does this magic trick work? Why does doing prime factors and finding pairs and crossing one out, like it, it legit seems like magic, but what is actually going on? Yeah. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know if it came off well, but I, I get it because I understand the procedure. Do you? Can you just, um, you have Bingo. What you're actually doing, and some students choose to do what I'm about to show you guys. Like when I simplify radicals, guys, I don't do these factor trees. I can look at it and do it in my head and write the answer down. And here's, here's how. Now, this is a little bigger of a number to do this with, but here, here's what I'm getting at. The, the square root of 180, our goal, if you want to do this mathematically, like what you're actually doing algebraically, is to find a perfect square that goes into that number evenly. Like the biggest perfect square. When I say perfect squares, I'm talking 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, like, et cetera. Now, again, this is a little bigger number, so I'm going to tell you, but the biggest perfect square that goes into 180 is 36. 36 times 5 is the square root of 180, is 180. So you don't have to ever do this, but I do think it's my responsibility to show you guys what's happening. So think about this. This right here, these are equivalent to each other. The square root of 180 is equivalent to the square root of 36 times square root of 5. Those mean the same exact thing. And then all I'm doing is taking the square root of 36. That's where that six is coming from on the outside. We're finding a perfect square that goes into the number and then we're square rooting it. And that's, that's what's happening. So some students like to do this really quickly. So think about it. If I said square root of 20, okay? If you didn't want to do a factor tree. So think about this one. What would the square root of 20 simplify into if you were doing it kind of looking at perfect squares kind of way? Yeah, two radical five, because you have four and five, right? The square root of four is two, so you have a two on the outside and a five on the inside. So it's just a real quick way, that's what you're actually doing. Now, if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, that's also fine, okay? But if you wanna do a factor tree every single time and have a way, then, then do you, do that. I'm okay with it. But again, I'm always gonna talk about like what's happening and why. All right, number two. So we add a variable in here. We have the square root of 48, x to the fifth. Now the 48 part is easy because we're just gonna do that the same exact way. Okay, we're gonna treat this kind of as two different problems. First thing we're gonna do is simplify the square root of 48. Yeah. Not four to the third, four radical three. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I do exactly what you meant. And I guarantee you have it written right on your paper, but I'm always gonna get you guys to say the right thing. So four radical three. Now, if you wanna do that with a factor tree, by all means go ahead, but 48 is 16 times three. Square root of 16 is four. So you get that four on the outside. So that's four radical three. If you wanna do a factor tree to verify that, please, please do. Okay, notice I'm leaving some space after the four. Because when we have variables, we're also able to take some variables out sometimes. We want to get as much out as we possibly can. Now I'm going to show you guys one option to do this, okay? Just like we did with these prime factors over here and we're looking for pairs, well, think about what x to the fifth means. x to the fifth, and I'm going to write this out, but x to the fifth means x times x times x times x times x. Like I write out what x to the fifth actually means. And then with that, we do the same exact thing as we do with those prime factors. Look for pairs, right? So I have a pair of x's, one's gone. Another pair, one's gone. Remember, anything that had a pair, that's coming on the outside. You multiply them together. So if I'm taking out an x and an x, we get x squared on the outside. 
this X right here stays on the inside. Now, when you guys go home and you're doing your homework and you're checking your answers in the back, I hate how the book writes these answers. And so I want to tell this ahead of time so you guys understand. Like your book will write this answer as this. They'll do that. They'll put that variable that came out on the end. I hate that because then it's like, okay, is that inside or outside the radical? So, but I'm just giving you a heads up for when you guys check your answers, that's what the book is actually doing. So be, just be careful. I would honestly prefer you do this. Okay. Because if you're writing your answer on a test or a quiz and you write that radical bar a little too far like that, now you're at the mercy of me making a judgment call. Like, do you know, it's not actually under there. Like, so I just put it out in front. Now here's the deal on a test or a quiz. I am highly unlikely to do like X to the fifth or X to the third. I am much more likely to do like X to the 50th. Okay. I am much more likely to have you guys do X to the 50th or X to the 51st. So my question to you, how would we do it if they were, well, let's back up. What could you do? Technically, what could you do? Yeah. That's what you should do. But what, which is the right answer, but what could you do theoretically? You could write 50 X's out and then circle all your pairs. I would not want to do it, but my point is find a way, right? If you're taking a test or a quiz and you're like, ah, well, crap, I don't remember how to do this one. So here come 50 X's, right? Like have a way. I used to do that on the SAT or ACT. That test, those tests are hard. And I remember sitting there and like, I would get to a problem and I would be like, this is going to take me five minutes to get this answer, but dang it, I know I'm going to get one of these answers right. And I would like expand out like a pattern to like the 82nd term to get to the answer when there was probably an easier way, but I'm like, I at least want to get a problem right. And so I am not advising you to write out 50 X's. I would not do it. But if that's the only way you're taking a test or a quiz, you have a brain fart, then do it. Now, what did you say the way you should do it? Divide it by two, right? I mean, think about it ahead of time. If you wrote out 50 X's and circled all your pairs, well, half go away and half come out, right? So you would have 4X to the 25th. What if I did the 51st? What if I said, okay, let's do X to the 51st? Yeah. Yeah. So yep. So yeah, you could, I mean, however you need to think through it, go ahead. I, I would drop it down to the nearest even number, like 50 and take half of those out and you're going to have one left on the inside. Absolutely. So it's like you would have four X to the 25th again, but you would have three and there would be an X left over and think about why. I mean, if you expanded 51 X's, right? Well, all but one would have a partner to circle and that one would be left inside the radical. Okay. So just things like that, those are things that I'm going to try to get you guys to really think through. Where it gets tricky is this. this. This messes people up all the time. If I do like X to the ninth, what do you think a common wrong answer would be to this problem? X to the, X third. To the third. Yeah, bingo. Because you see the nine, you see the square root, and your brain just wants to play tricks with you and be like, oh, the square root of nine is three. But you're not taking the square root of nine, right? So this would be, go down to the next even. And so it'd be X to the fourth and you'd have an X on the inside. So just be careful because your brain's going to play all sorts of tricks with you. Okay. All right. So you guys have done those before. Whether you remembered it, I, I don't know. And that's why I'm reteaching it. But you've done square roots before. You've never done a cube root. Well, maybe you have, I don't know. But I want to simplify the cube root of 16. Anybody without a calculator, does anybody know about what the decimal approximation would be? Just throwing that out there. Two? Is the answer two? Is two times two times two equal to 16? So it's not two. The decimal, what's the decimal? I don't want the decimal answer, but I want to see if you guys can kind of 
make some approximations here. What? Four point something? Two point something? I think it'd be less than 2.5. 2.5. Four maybe. And where these approximations are coming from, think about this. Two cubed would give you eight, right? Two cubed is eight. What's three cubed? 27. So we need some number between, to get to 16, we need some number between two and three. 16 is like eight away from this one and 11 away from this. So it's going to be, I don't know, 2.4-ish. I don't know. And you're not going to have to do this on a test or a quiz. I'm just trying to get you guys to like think. Yeah. Well, that's how we're going to actually do it. To actually do the problem, okay? Well, if, yeah, we're simplifying a cube root. Well, with a square root, we look for groups of two. With a cube root, we're looking for groups of three. If it was a fourth root, we'd look for groups of four. And once you find, in this case, a group of three, you take one out. Like for every group you have, one comes out. So we're going to do the same exact thing. We're going to do a factor tree. So 16, you can either put four and four, or you can put two and eight. It doesn't matter how you start. So I'll do four and four to keep my branches even. So then two and two, two and two. I'll keep my in the time, 31. Oh, yeah, we're perfect. All right, so we are looking for a group of three. Now I know there's four twos, that doesn't matter. We just need a group of three twos. So for every group of three we have, well now I'm gonna cross two of them out. Only one is gonna come out. So a two is gonna be on the outside. We're gonna have a two on the inside. Here's the most common mistake students make when they simplify something other than a square root. So anything higher than two. This is the most common mistake students make is they put that answer. Oops. <laughs> and that's wrong. You still have to keep the index. If you're simplifying a cube root, your final answer is still gonna have a cube root. And a lot of people forget to put that little index right there. So it's two times the cube root of two. Okay. Mathematically, what's happening, you know, with the square roots, I said, let's find the biggest perfect square that goes into the number. Well, with cube roots, mathematically, you could think, what's the biggest perfect cube that goes into 16? The biggest perfect cube that goes into 16. Your perfect cubes are right here. 8, 27, 64, 125, 216. The biggest one is 8. Right? You don't have to do this, but I think it's good to show. So the cube root of 16 is the same as the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 2. Like those mean the same thing. And what is the cube root of 8? It's 2. That's where that 2 on the outside is coming from. And notice what's left. You're still left with that cube root right there. That's why that index is staying. Okay? That's probably the most common mistake students make on those problems. They forget that index. Any questions? So we're going to jump in the second half of the section. You guys remember doing these? Not the cube root per se, but the other ones? Okay, good. All right. The last few. There is a relationship between radicals and exponents. There's a relationship. Just like there's a relationship between fractions and decimals. Right? There are, if I said one half is the same as what decimal? What's it the same as? 0.5, right? 0. They mean 5. the same thing, they just look different. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you the relationship here. My first question, if you had to guess, if you had to guess what 16 to the one half power is without a calculator. Eight. Nope. Four. four. Why? We know why. If you're, unless you're just throwing out a guess. It is four. You're not, well, if you were multiplying it by a half, you get eight. <laughs> you're square rooting it. If you take something to the one half power, that's the same as taking the square root of a number. Okay, so for instance, 
I'm going to write a little list here. Like the square root of five is the same as five to the one half power. They mean the same exact thing. They look different, right? Those two things look different, but they mean the same thing. Just like one half and 0.5 look different, but they mean the same exact thing. So it's just two different forms. This is called radical form. This is called exponent form. When I say rational exponent, a rational number is a fraction. So when we say rational exponents, that means like a fraction exponent. Those mean the same exact thing, okay? What if I had, well, I'm gonna show this. If I took the cube root of five squared, that's what's called radical form. And if I was gonna write this in the corresponding exponent form, like what does this mean? Well, I'm gonna tell you. This means five to the two thirds power. Did you? Anybody remember seeing this? Who do you have for house of one? Parish, Anybody else have Parish? Do you remember learning this? You don't? Maybe you were going that day. I don't know. I don't know what you guys learned. Okay, so these are equivalent here, okay? Now, the way you go from radical form to exponent form, I still remember my algebra two teacher in high school constantly saying power over root, power over root, power over root, power over root. The way you get your exponent is whatever the power is of your radical form. So notice your power here is two, so it's power over whatever your root or whatever your index is, like whatever the number on the outside is, like it's root three. So that's where that three comes from. So the way you get your exponent, it's whatever the power is over whatever the root is. So to make that, you know, with the square root, what's the power on that five on the inside? What's five being raised to? If there is no exponent, what exponent is there? There's a one, right? This is five to the first power. We don't write it, but it's a one. That's your power. And then if there's no index out here, it's a two. So that's where that one half is coming from. The one is the power that five is being raised to, and two is the root that you're taking of it. So that's how you're going to go back and forth, okay? Between forms. Sometimes in a problem, it's going to be beneficial to go from radical form to exponent form to help do the problem. Sometimes it's going to be helpful to go from exponent form to radical form to help do the problem. And we'll get some practice, like when, when is it good to go in which direction, okay? What I want you to do, I would normally do this in partners. I do a lot of group stuff, and I'm going to try to do less, which is not good for you guys. I'm going to try to do less of it. Um, but I want you guys to try to evaluate 9 to the 1.5 without a calculator. Just do it by yourself. Um, now, what does it mean? Here's a really good question. I've learned this over the past few years that students, a lot of students don't know what evaluate means. What do I mean when I say evaluate? Like, what should the final answer be? Anybody know? Yeah. Not a radical, I guess. Not a fra it could be a fraction. It doesn't have to be a fraction. Mm -mm. Just, just a number answer, like a numeric answer. Like when I, when I say that, like an answer of like four or 3.5, when I say evaluate, I'm saying find the value of something. Like your final answer should be one number in the end. Okay. So you guys without a calculator, to, you guys at home too, try to do nine to the 1.5. Yeah. There shouldn't be any X's because there's no X's here. Though. And this is what I was talking about last night. It's okay to be wrong in this class. Don't leave it blank. Don't sit there and say, I don't know what to do. Like, do something. It could be the most wrong answer of all time. And you're going to learn more from doing that than doing nothing. Keep going. So that's what I mean when I say the final. You're, you're on the right track. 
when I say the final answer should be a number, that means like you shouldn't have any radicals in the answer. You should get to an actual number in the end. There you go. Supposed to have a fire drill next block. Is it still raining out? Was it raining when you guys got here? No. That's good. It was raining earlier this morning to put oh, me back my, to sleep. My shoes and socks are actually really wet right now. But for the first, like before school started, I was sitting here barefoot trying to dry them out. Pretty gross. Ew. It actually made it worse when I put them back on. It felt even more cold and more wet. Oh. Well. I had to walk my dog every morning, so it was just pouring, walking that stupid mud. Mm. Well, I did. And then when I was going to my car, then they got more wet and stepped in puddles. And my jeans were like wet. Good start to the day. But I'm excited. I'm excited all weekend. Excited to just teach. I didn't teach at all last week because I was here four days, but did all the introduction stuff. Like I didn't see any students twice, so it was all introductory stuff. That was get into it. All right. What'd you get? Twenty-seven. You got twenty-seven. You are correct. You did not get twenty-seven. That's fine. Now we're gonna learn why. Okay. My hope is this, Here, here's my hope, is that we at least, okay, we're sitting there, we're talking about fraction exponents. My hope is that you at least say, well, 1.5 is the same as three halves. Like if you got there, okay, you're, you're in pretty good shape, right? That's the hope. Now we just learned how to change from exponent form to radical form. Maybe that would help, right? Like this is what I was talking about where sometimes it's beneficial to go and switch forms. Okay, let's rewrite this in radical form. So three is my power, two is my root. Let's think about what that means. That means we have the square root of nine cubed. The square root of nine cubed. Now my promise to you at the very beginning of the lesson, I said, if you did not have a calculator, you do not have to know what nine cubed is. Anybody know what nine cubed is? I don't. Did you like do long multiplication? Yeah, so I my, do. that's not bad, okay? But my promise to you is you will never have to do, it's not wrong, it can help you get, it's like, if, it's that, if that's what you need to do, go ahead and do it. But my promise is I will never have you do like long multiplication and long division and doing all this figuring off to the side if you don't have a calculator. What that means is there has to be a better way than, huh, it's like one of those TV commercials, there would gotta be a better way than doing nine cubed. Because even if you get to nine cubed, now you have to take the square to that number, right? Which is not impossible. Did you get there? You did, yeah, it's hard, right? So here's a little radical trick for you guys, okay? Rather than getting here and saying, hmm, what's nine cubed? Here's a trick. If you have a power under the radical, you can actually pull that power outside of the radical. Meaning this is the same as the square root of nine cubed. Those are equivalent statements right there. That problem is much easier to do because what's the square root of nine? Three, and then we have three cubed, which is 27, right there. So if you have a radical or an exponent under the radical, just a nice nifty trick, you could pull it out and make the problem a whole lot more simplified. Now your route, I wanna talk about this. So she said, she, you like simplified that, right? Nine cubed and got nine radical nine, yeah. is that, yeah. So let's say you're like, okay, nine cubed, maybe this is the route you take. You're like nine cubed is nine times nine times nine. Well, I have a pair of nines. So I have nine radical nine. Like I could see people getting here, but that's why my point is if a problem says evaluate, your final answer should be a number. They're not gonna be any radicals or anything like that in the end. So let's think about what nine radical nine is. Well, it's nine times three. So 27 that way. Just another route to get there, okay? But this is what I'm talking about problem solving. And what, you know, what did we learn that would help me get the answer to this problem? I love on notes having you guys try things first and then seeing what you're gonna do right and wrong, okay? 
Any questions on that? Well, then we should be able to do 64 to the negative 2 thirds power without a calculator. Try it. Have fun. Smile while you do it. Because if you smile while you do math, then you associate math with happiness. True story. If you sit there and do math and smile, then later when you do math, you'll smile and be happy. Try it out. Proven fact, psychologically. It's best not to, but it could be. Fire drill postponed till tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat place. Same bat channel. This is a good problem, by the way. Gave you a chance, but if you're stuck, this would probably be my first step, is deal with the negative exponent first. Anytime you can deal with a negative exponent from the get-go, I would do it. Negative exponents suck, guys. So if you can like move them around first and get rid of the negative, do that. You guys like being home on Thursday, Friday? Mm -hmm. You did not like. They might like it. You're okay with it. You liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Oh, should I be watching these people? No one's sleeping over there, are you? If you're sleeping, say yes. Try out that new shade nice place over uh, my wings, etc. Highly recommend it. We went there twice this weekend, you know, Saturday and Sunday. They got Dole Whips. They're in Disney and they have Dole Whips. They have five different flavors of Dole Whip. They got all sorts of flavors of like snow cones with shaved ice. And they put ice cream on bottom. And you get to the end, you got the, the snow cone mixed with the ice cream. Oh, so good. Recommend. How you doing? You killing it? Yeah, I did. Oh, you're so close. <clears throat> so close. So remember, negative exponents don't mean like pull the negative out. It means reciprocal. It's your first step. Oh, you that. You did all like the exponent radical stuff, right? How you doing? Switch that form. Once you get there, switch that to radical form. All right, let's see. Did you get an answer? No answer? Did you get an answer? What'd you get? 1 16th is correct. 1 16th. So step one, make that exponent positive, right? Make that exponent positive, make your life a whole lot easier. Now all the work is gonna be done in the denominator here. We're still gonna have a one on top. Like it's gonna be one over whatever we get, but now we gotta switch the form, right? Power over root. 
So we have one over, it's the cube root of 64 squared. So we switch that form, power root. And again, here's the deal. I have no idea what 64 squared is. And I'm not gonna sit there and do lattice, you guys learn lattice multiplication? So last year with the e-learning, like they did two by two numbers multiplication. We did not teach our son that. We taught him like how to actually do it like normal. The teacher said that was fine. Like she wasn't mad about it. She showed them the lattice stuff. But I was like, what, what is that stuff? Taught it the regular way. Yeah. And it's not bad, but I think if you're capable of doing it the other way. So, agreed. And when are you really going to multiply out two digits by two digits by hand anyway? Yeah. You know, like you have phones, you have calculators. What are we doing? <laughs> What's that? But that's what I'm saying. I'm not going to make you do that. Well, they, have, they still do times tables to make sure they know all their quick facts. But if you're multiplying it two by two, I don't know. I don't understand drawing all the lattice bars and stuff. Yeah, I, I was not a fan, but it's whatever. Okay, so again, I have no idea what 64 squared is, but here's my trick to you. If you have an exponent under the radical, pull it outside the radical. Make your life so much easier. Pull that two out because then you have one over the cube root of 64 and then all that squared, right? It, they mean the same thing, but now I know what the cube root of 64 is. You are going to have to know this little list right here of cubes if you don't have those, have those down. We're going to have to know what the cube root of 64 is. You're going to have to know what the cube root of 125 is, maybe up to 216. That's getting ambitious, but it'd be fair. Like if I put it on there, I wouldn't feel guilty. Okay, but I, you know, you need to know this basic list here. So the cube root of 64 is just four. So it's one over and then four squared, which is 116. So just taking our steps along the way and getting to the, getting to the final answer. Any questions? We've got one left. Save the best for last. Okay. Last one. We're going to simplify the eighth root of 16 times the sixth root of 125. Any guesses on how to start? If you had to do it, what would you do? Yeah. Let's try a factor tree. So if we do a factor tree, let me do this off to the side. Let's start with the eighth root of 16. So if I do a factor tree, what do we need a group of to pull one out? We need a group of eight, right? All right, let's roll, Paw Patrol. Did we get a group of eight? Uh -huh. Huh? What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, to simplify, you need a group of eight. We didn't get there. So we tried a strategy we learned, didn't work. Okay, good thought. What's another strategy we learned in this, in this lesson? Put it, put it in exponent form. Let's see if we switch the form, if that'll help us do the work, right? If we switch the form on this, well, that would be 16 to the 1 8th power over root, and that would be 125 to the 1 sixth. Now here's what I'm gonna say about exponent rules. Like you guys all know the exponent rules, but students do still kind of mix some stuff up. <laughs> we can't actually multiply these two numbers together. The 16 and the 125, you can't multiply those together because they're being raised to different powers. We can't multiply them. And we can't use our exponent rules because those exponent rules only work if you're multiplying things with the same base, right? That's what they all revolve around. Yeah. Common denominator between 16 and 125? 
the re so the reason that won't work and that's that's what i was trying to say like the whole point of exponent rules of when you can add the exponents that rule only works if you're multiplying two things with the same base because then you keep the base and you add the exponents right that's that whole rule we are not multiplying two things with the same base on this problem so throw that rule out the window right and that's how it's good to know the rules but we have to know like okay what is the actual rule so i'll be honest that wasn't helpful at all you got nowhere <laughs> so we tried a strategy of simplifying didn't work we tried switching the form didn't work okay here's the next thing sometimes and this is going to come into play a little bit throughout the year this is not going to, I'm going to go through this problem and some of you guys are going to be like, I don't think I could do that. Okay. And that's okay. You'll be assessed on it, but it's not going to be like a huge thing throughout the year. All right. Sometimes you're going to have to change numbers to make them look different, but mean the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. Like the number 16, what's another way I can write the number 16 with exponents. Exponents and radicals go really well together. So what's another way that I can write the number 16? Yeah, four squared is good. And that would be helpful. There's an even better one. You're not wrong. What else would give us 16? Uh, two four cubed. Squared. Two cubed? Two to the fourth. All right. Two to the fourth is 16. Right, because two times two times two times two is 16. So bear with me here for a second, okay? You'll see why this is beneficial. So I'm gonna rewrite 16 to be two to the fourth power. Okay, and again, you'll see why this is helpful here in, in just a second. But understand, I didn't change anything yet. 16 and two to the fourth mean the same thing. I just changed how it looked. I didn't change like, anything about the problem. What about 125? What's another way that we can write 125? Five to the third. Five cubed is 125. Again, you're gonna see why this is helpful here very shortly. So I changed those numbers to look different but mean the same thing. What'd you say? Five to the half and two to the half. So now look what happens, okay? Now, if I change this from radical form to exponent form, look at the benefit of this. This would be two to the four eighths power. What is four eighths reduced to? One half. So now, look at this. We had all these gross, you know, in indexes and things like that. But what is two to the one half the same as? What is that equivalent to? What does that mean? Square root of two. Right, anything to the one half power is square root. So through that whole transformation, the eight root of 16 is the same exact thing as the square root of two. They mean the same exact thing. Like if you would type those in your calculator, they mean the same thing. I'm also gonna teach you how to type that in your calculator here in just a second. Well, let's do the right side. This would be five to the three sixths. So five to the one half which is square root of five. What is the square root of two times the square root of five? You could say it, I heard someone say it. Square root of 10, yeah. You're allowed to multiply radicals together if they have the same index and they're both twos there. Like right at the beginning, we were not allowed to multiply the 16 and the 125 because they don't have the same index there. But once you get them to have the same index, square root of 10. Some students look at that, look at that and, be, and, and think, I remember being this way in algebra too, like I would have never thought of that, right? I would never have thought of that. My advice to you, like a little tip off on when you might do the strategy is when you have really high indexes. Like if you see an index of eight, if you see an index of 10, like gross ones like that, that's probably the tip off that maybe we need to use that strategy to try to reduce that index. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that index smaller to make it more manageable. Okay. So that's kind of the tip off there. I do want to show you guys how to enter like a bigger root in your calculator. Um, hopefully we're getting some graphing calculators here. So I want you guys to get your calculator out. Okay. You guys at home too. So I can show this. Now, 
on a test, on a quiz, on your homework, you're probably not going to be typing and getting decimal answers. But these things do show up like in real life. So if you ever want to see the decimal approximation, here's how we do it. If I wanted to do like the eighth root of 16, well, let's just do the cube root of something first. So if I wanted to do the cube root of 20, oh wait, what was that one we were approximating earlier? Cube root, let's do that. Cube root of 16. Let's see what that actual uh, number was. Cube root of 16. So on your calculator, there's a lot of buttons and I'm going to teach you guys throughout the year, like how to utilize these graphing calculators quite a bit. Okay. So we are going to live a lot of times in this math menu right here on the left column On the left column. There's a button right here that says math. And if you push it, it brings up a host of options here. If you want to do the cube root of something, they have a cube root option right here. Three, so it's a three and then a square root. Now in my, here's the difference with some calculators. On my calculator, when I push that button, it puts the cube root there automatically. Some of your calculator, they might get a calculator where um, it shows a three and then it shows X and then a square root sign. Okay, if you have that, then you have to push the index first. So like, um, I'll show you here in a second. Anyway, we get two, oh, I was thinking it was 2.4-ish, it was 2.5-ish. But if you wanna do some other root, Okay, let's say we wanted to figure out what the eighth root of 16 is down here. So in your calculator, if you have the one I was just talking about where it shows like the X first, you have to push the index first. On most of the calculators now, they're updated enough that if I push math and I scroll down to where it says X root right there, that's gonna let you put in any index that you want. So if I put that, shoot, clear that out. Math, X root, I don't know why it's putting answer there. I'm gonna delete that. So if you go up to where it says, I don't know why mine says answer there, but if you go up there and push delete in the top, it'll get rid of it. So now if I put eight in that little box and I put six, just use the arrows, arrow into the 16, that's gonna do the eighth root of 16. 1.4142135162. Probably not going to play around with that on your homework, but I think it's important to show because if you're taking a quiz or a test and you do have a calculator at your disposal, like this will help you check answers. I'm all about like you find a way to get to your answer, but you should also have a way to check and see if you're right. I had a kid last year. He was a freshman. Um, you guys know Sebastian McGinnis? A little bit. So he, on all his tests and all his quizzes, he would do all his problems, but then he would go back and he always had a way to check every answer, like a second option. And he would go back and check and he would write real dark check marks on all the side. Like he got an answer and then he would check mark all of them off. Yeah, perfect on pretty much everything. Um, because he always made sure he knew if the answers were right before he turned his stuff in. So I think it's smart just to have ways to check answers. And I'll, I'll talk about that as the year goes on. Okay. Any questions on this lesson? We are gonna have a quiz next class over exponent rules and then over this stuff. Now the way that's going to work, here's how this is going to work when we have assessments. You guys at home, you'll come in, we'll have a warm up um, practicing this stuff, we'll go over the homework, you guys will take your quiz, okay? Just like a normal class. You guys at home, you're going to get on Zoom, I'm going to take attendance, you guys are going to do the next lesson, okay? When you when I see you guys, what would that be? Thursday? Then you guys will come in and take that quiz. We'll have a warm up. We'll go over the homework. Like you'll get your questions answered. Um, and then you guys will take your quiz. Does that sound, did I say that right? Oh yeah. Friday, Friday. Yes. But I will make sure anytime you guys have a quiz or a test, like I want to make sure I don't just want to hop in and say, Oh, quiz time. Like I, you'll have time to ask questions. We'll go over the homework. Like I said, you'll have warm-up problems to practice what's going to be on the quiz and stuff. So you'll be prepared, but also make sure you're asking questions, you know, throughout the week if you if you do have any. Okay. All right. You guys at home, you can hop off. Class over in six minutes. So you guys can just hang out right now. Or you can start the homework if you really want to, but you can just hang out. <clears throat> I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Peace out, homies.
So now I need to figure out the recording. Stop.